Hi folks, okie dokie, right, let's crack on. What I wanted to do today was to uh, produce a video on Lightroom's masking with emphasis on a little bit of um, where it doesn't work very well and also mainly as a follow-up to a couple of videos I've done over the past week, 10 days for my patrons, um, a, um, where I was talking about various combinations of selections and masking. And I did say that I was going to do a video detailing the intercepted selections that are available. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Photoshop, and the masking um, tasks that you can do within Photoshop, you might be wondering what an intersected selection is. So we're going to process this image in Lightroom using various techniques, including a couple of intersected selections. But first of all, what I want to do is explain to you just exactly what is an intersected selection. And so we might just as well go over to Photoshop. Um, first of all, I'm going to start out with a completely blank document. And I'm going to come and pick up my elliptical marquee tool. Okay. And with reference to selections in Photoshop, you have these four little mode buttons up here. Um, we have single selection. We have add to selection, we have subtract from selection, and we have intersect selection. So let's start out with the normal bog standard selection. All right, standalone selection. So if I draw an elliptical selection like that, and then I go to draw another elliptical selection, the minute I start to draw, the second selection, the initial one, disappears. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that virtually everybody's used to. So it's Command D to deselect. And then what we'll do is we'll switch over to the second mode, which is Add to Selection. So I'll draw an initial elliptical selection, and then I'll draw a second I can draw a second selection somewhere else in the image, or I can go and do a third selection and intersect it with the other two, or overlap it with the other two, and there we go. So this second mode adds more data, if you like, image data, to a pre-existing selection. So in other words, the selected area becomes larger. All right. So it's Command D to deselect, and then we'll move on to subtract. So I can go and lay in an original selection, and then I can bring in a second selection. And if I overlap those selections like that, then you'll see that the second selection has disappeared, but it is also removed the overlapping bit of the second selection from the initial selection. So we end up with a wonky crescent moon. Okie dokie. So we'll go Command D to deselect and we'll come to the last option, which is the one which is most interesting and most useful to you when you want to dial into particular details within an image. Um, and that is the intersected selection. So let us do an initial selection. And then let's bring in a second selection. Overlap it. And what are we left with? That's right. We're left just with a, with a selection that is just of the area that was common to both selections. All right. Sounds confusing. Yes, I know. Now, you'll also notice that um, under the cursor, we have a little X sign in the, in the bottom right-hand corner. That is the sign for an intersected selection. Though I can't really see it happening inside a Lightroom. But it's all very well watching me doing these 
elliptical selections on a piece of white, um, I was going to say a piece of white paper, but what am I talking about? On a bog standard white document in Photoshop. What use is it really in real imaging terms? Okay, so let us switch over to this puffing shot. Okay, so what we can use intersected selections for is to combine different areas, okay, within a selection and to make a new selection, all right, which is very good for when we're doing a masking with adjustment layers, etc., where we want to zoom in on a particular part of the subject, say, such as this puffy. And we want to zoom, we want to be able to work in finite detail, um, defined by the pixels within the image, as opposed to a brushed-in manual selection, which is never anywhere near as precise as it would be if it was done on a pixel-based mask. So, let us say I want to go and select color range and I want to select all the reds okay because the puffing has got red on its beak so if I switch over to the channels panel and I now add that selection as a new alpha channel that alpha channel which is fundamentally a mask you can think of and it's also a selection yes <laughs> because selections and alpha channel masks are you can think of them as basically one and the same thing. Uh, they're not, but you can think of it that way. So there we've got a indication of a selection of all the red pixels in the image. Okie dokie. So we command click back on the composite RGB and command D to deselect. Okay, and what can we do now? What we could do is go to select color range and select the yellows in the image and click OK. And we're still over here in the channels panel. We can add that as an alpha channel and command D to deselect. And so what I've got is a, a map of all the yellow in the image. Okay, now the bird or puffin has actually got a very interesting piece of yellow here and red in its bill. So if I wanted to do a levels adjustment on just the red and yellow pixels, yeah, just a one step adjustment, what I could do, let's just rename these uh, channels. Alpha 1 was red, so we'll title that R. Alpha 2 was yellow, so we'll title that Y. Okay, so what I can do is I can add yellow and red alpha channels. All right, so here's the first thing. In Photoshop, we've got those modes, but they're also controllable by keys on your keyboard. And the important keys are Command, Alt or Option, and shift all right so if i command or control click on that red channel you can see the little marching ants have just come up there so i've got an active selection and if i then hover over the red channel don't click it just hover over it and you can see if i hold the command key down i get an empty square coming underneath the hand tool all right like that so if i now hold down shift as well you see i'll get a plus sign in there so if i click now you can see i've added the red selection to this original um, alpha channel so if i now add that as a new alpha channel and command D to deselect, you can now see that the yellow areas are br very bright and the red areas are very bright. Okay, so what we can do now is rename that as R plus 
Y, and red plus yellow, hit return. It's okay. So now we come back to the composite RGB view. And if I now go and select, um, where I'll be load selection, if I now select R plus Y, so I've got that as an active selection, I then come to an adjustment layer, and let's say I pull up an adjustment layer, you can see that it's applied that alpha channel as a mask. So if I wanted to make the um, yellows and the reds a bit brighter, you can see that I can do so. And I'll just put in a 1.5 adjustment there. Okay, so there we go. Now, the only thing is, of course, what I've done is I've also brightened up all the greens because in nature, all the greens that you see out there in the wild, so to speak, contain an awful lot of yellow. So what I've done is I've turned up the yellow component of all the greens in the image, which isn't something I really wanted to do. So here's where intersected selections come in really handy. So if I turn that adjustment off and I come back to my uh, layer that is the active image layer, I can now go select and just click select subject, for example. All right, and it's done an okay job of selecting the subject. We could go in with uh, select a mask and refine the edge, yada, yada. But for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm not going to bother doing that. But if I come over to the channels panel, I can now save that as a separate alpha channel. And there it is. So what we'll do is we'll call that sub for subject. Alrighty. And I'll command D to deselect. So what I can now do is to intersect the subject and the red plus yellow alpha channels or if you like the subject and the red plus yellow selections so if i command click on the subject selection and then i hover over r plus y which is our red plus yellow alpha channel and i hold down command or control alt or option and shift you'll see i'll get that little multiplication or x sign in the box under the little hand tool. And if I just click like that, yeah, and then I add that new alpha channel, and there we go. So that is an intersected selection of our subject and the reds and the yellows within the image. So if I go Command D to deselect, and I come back to my composite RGB view, go over to layers, and then I go select, load selection, and we come to alpha one, which I didn't bother renaming, and we click okay, and then I go to the adjustments, and I get that self same levels adjustment, and I just go and type in the same value as we had before, which is 1.5, okie dokie, and so we turn it off, and we turn it back on again, off, on off on you can see we've made the adjustment we wanted to make to the puffing but it's not affected the background at all obviously it's gone a bit wonky down here so the way i would get around that this is totally superfluous to the point of the um, uh, point of the um, video lesson but i could put that layer in its own new group I could add a layer mask to that and then just hit the B key, pull up my brush tool, painting with black and then where, it, where we've got this jaggy edge here, I could just paint over there in black so I can't see that adjustment because the adjustment really only pertains to the beak and facial areas of the puffing and we don't really want anywhere else showing in that selection. So there we go. Um, that is the power of an intersected selection. It, it, it might appear long-winded to you, but once you get used to doing it in Photoshop, you can really dial in to very, very specific 
um, parts of your subject, for landscape photographers especially, um, it is a really, really common practice to use intersected selections when you're doing adjustment layers on a landscape image. But I quite frequently use them whenever I find the need to, but I'm used to using them. All right, now we know what an intersected selection is. Let's get back to Lightroom. So um, I can never process the same image twice and come up with the same result, but this is the sort of result we're going for. And if you'll notice how the colours of the bladderack seaweed and the green whatever it is underneath the water um, actually sort of pop out a bit though the reason they pop out and they pop out in a graduated manner from front to back within the image is down to a couple of intersected selections which we can now do with masking inside of Lightroom but what I'm going to do is dial back to this starting uh, point snapshot here which is fundamentally the raw file because you can see we're working on a raw file um, this is my process version swap if you like um, thing I've always done and I've shown you many times how to do and it, it, it's basically a linearization of the image but I have made one or two adjustments on top of that uh, for those of you who are Patreon members, you can go and download this image and work along with me. And if you do apply my standard process version swap to this image, you're then going to need to do the following to catch up to where we are now. So exposure is down at minus 0 0.4. Uh, contrast is at minus 33. Highlights are at minus 43. Shadows are at plus 27. Blacks are at plus 32. Clarity is at plus 10, dehaze plus 11, vibrance plus 18, saturation plus 13, tone curve is where it should be with a standard process version swap or linearization um, in subtle inverted S shaped tone curve. There's nothing been done in the HSL, nothing been done in color grading. Details. Now, in the details, and this is something. I would say, uh, or would advise strongly to anybody and everybody who's using these masks in Lightroom, turn your sharpening off. Because um, Lightroom sharpening, if you're not careful, can generate halos in areas of extreme contrast uh, deviation. And if you start generating halos, your masks are go your mask edges are going to become wildly inaccurate. Um, but it's something you don't see unless you're working on full-size images. Um, so, you know, um, I'm not going to say anything about other YouTube presenters, but well, there you go. Um, but my advice is to temporarily turn sharpening off because, you see, Lightroom does its sharpening based on the information that it can see in the image. If we change the ratio of tones and colours and things like that within an image, when we go to apply the sharpening again, it will come up with a different result. All right. <laughs> so where it might have put halos in before, it won't put them in if you do it later. So keep your sharpening turned off in Lightroom while you're doing masking adjustments. That is my takeaway for everybody from this in general terms. Um, no noise reduction, nothing else. Lens corrections. I've actually removed chromatic aberration and I've also done something I never usually do, which is enable profile corrections. Um, but this lens does have a tendency to bow horizons just a little bit. So just simply enable profile corrections, just got rid of that. So there we go. Uh, transform, nothing done there. Effect, nothing done there. Camera calibration, this is important. Shadows, tint, plus five. Red primary up plus 11, saturation still at zero. Green primary adjusted to minus 35 with saturation at plus 9. And the blue primary hue change minus 11, saturation change plus 12. So there we go. So that's how we end up at our starting point. All right, so let's get back to oh, the job at hand. Now, 
the first thing is let's go and open up the masking yes now then I suppose the first thing I want to do is to get the sky under control and this is where I have real massive problems um, that seem to exist between me and all the other people who've done videos on this where they all seem to get the sky to work perfectly uh, it doesn't yeah and you will most likely suffer with the self same problem if I go to select sky Bomb, 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 detecting sky. Yes, there we go. It's done a not too bad a job. Not really. Um, but, of course, it's selected quite a lot of um, the um, rocks. So what we could do, fundamentally, is go in with a brush and, you know, sort of brush away some of this um, overspill of this green overlay and the other thing i would like you to get into the idea of doing is you can see i've got a green uh, overlay selected by default it is red okay and by default it is sort of only at what at about 50 percent opacity so I do have a tendency to actually run it at full opacity so I can see what's happening. And also, sometimes I leave it in affected area. Other times I'll use it to show the unaffected area to check that I'm not actually getting any overspill into the sky. But you see, you already know that I've got rocks around the edges of this sea stack and over here involved within the sky selection uh, yet when i look at the inverse of the sky selection um, it doesn't look as if there's anything selected within this foreground um, so it is really difficult sometimes to actually see whether you've got a clean selection or not when you're looking at it with one of these colored overlays so sometimes you might find it's better to view it as white on black. All right. And now you can see where you've got um, incorrect versions of them um, or incorrect selections, I should say, of areas of your image. Um, if you use it white on black, you're looking at it as if you would be looking at it inside of Photoshop, which is quite a good idea actually um, i think it is anyway so we'll just leave it like that for the moment but do i really want these areas of these rocks being selected and you can see that we have got bits of sky which aren't within the selection so you know i mean it's entirely up to you <laughs> which way you want things to work um, i personally would go to add to the uh, or remove from the selection i should say because i'm looking at the uh, unaffected areas and um, i'll go and get a brush tool and of course i can paint out with that brush tool um, some of these areas of rock which are included seemingly in the selection um, just to keep the adjustment off um, the foreground so these masks inside of uh, Lightroom, if I just take off Auto Mask, uh, that'll help me fill some of these bits in. That's better. And uh, um, what was I saying? These masks inside of Lightroom are actually not very precise. There's a certain amount of fuzz to them, um, which um, makes them less precise, uh, but I suppose in a way makes them somewhat more usable uh, on the fly but anyway you know i mean it is what it is um, i'll just remove a little bit from there um, but what i would suggest is that you don't try and get your masks too well defined as long as they are not giving you completely imprecise and undesired um, adjustments um, I i'd suggest going with them and not trying to fiddle with the edges of them too much so 
what I'm um, going to do is just switch back to the color overlay and if you want if, you, if this gets in your way when you're actually working you can dock it over here or you can just simply double tap and it will auto dock so it, it's not floating around within your workspace so if I now turn off show overlay temporarily and I go to a fit to screen view um, what I want to do is now darken down my sky so all I'm going to do is to just darken it down a little bit and maybe add a little bit of dehaze to it rather like that um, too dark actually and there we go so there we go that's our fundamental adjustment to the sky done okay so what I now want to do is to get on and use a couple of these intersected selections to start to bring out brightness and color in the actual exposed seaweed on the rocks and this green seaweed underneath and start putting a little bit of color depth in the image so I'm going to create a new mask and I'm going to change or go for a color range selection um, I'm going to come into um, my overlays and I'm going to change this to affected area uh, for this operation because I'm, I just want to see the actual colors that I'm choosing I don't want to see the rest of the image highlighted so I quite frequently as you may have gathered change the way I visualize these overlays so don't just stick with one method um, I think I'm going to because I'm going to be dealing with quite reddish colors I'm going to change to a green overlay uh, rather like that and you can see I've chosen color range but I've got a, a little tr warning triangle in there meaning I've not got one chosen so we're going to come in at a quite large um, magnification and I'm just going to use my color range selector tool and I'm just going to pick a color okay rather like that right so now you can see I've picked the oranges and um, the orangey reds of that bladder act seaweed so we come out to a fit to screen view you can see all the colors in the image which are affected so if I was to make an adjustment here and take up exposure yeah, let's take it up a long way so we can see what we're affecting and let's give it a little bit of dehaze and let's give it a bump in saturation now you can see that I'm turning up colors left right and center obviously they turned up way too much um, and the other thing is I think the range is a little bit tight so we're going to increase the range as well all right the scope or span of colors related to the color that we chose uh, within the image so I mean it's looking a little bit a little bit on the surreal side that's because we've got way too much exposure dialed in but here's the thing I don't really want it affecting these colors up here um, at all and I don't really want it affecting the colors out here anywhere near as much as it affects the colors here all right so the first thing I'm going to do is to turn it down to a slightly more desirable result we'll leave it roughly there and then what I want to do is I want to intersect it intersect that selection with a graduated filter all right so if we come and hover over color range and then go to the little three dots you can see we can intersect mask with linear gradient the other way we can get there is to just hover over where where we've got the add and subtract buttons and hold down the option button and now we can see we've got intersect so we'll say intersect with linear gradient and I'm going to bring a linear gradient I'll hold down the shift key to keep it straight and we'll bring it sort of up to the waterline rather like that 
and then we'll sort of lift it up to probably about there and let's just check on that um, color range again and let's just see if we can brighten it up a little bit more for illustrative, uh, illustrative purposes and lift the highlights maybe add a little tad of contrast so now you can see without that linear gradient because i can hide the linear gradient oh we've got all the adjustments going on up here which is something we didn't want but if i turn that linear gradient visibility back on now you can see we've only got the adjustment right down here where the gradient is a um, white uh, going all the way up to where it's black and it's been hidden so we're hiding that color range selection 100 percent up here we're revealing it 100 percent down here and of course we're fading it with this graduated filter all righty so that's that done um i might just actually go and warm um that um, color range up that is what we've got selected we'll just warm it up a little bit as well and just add some richness in there and maybe just turn it down ever so slightly yeah i'm liking that so what we're going to do now is the same thing so we'll go for color range again uh, but this time what we're going to do is come in at 300 percent wow that is a bit larry isn't it <laughs> yes and i'm going to choose these sort of greens of this blurry seaweed that we can see rather like that underneath the water and we'll come out to a fit to screen view so we can see what's going on and see what's selected let's see if we can get a, a, a more colors being brought into the image which we can if we turn that range or refine slider up and then we're going to do exactly the same thing all down the out or option button we'll get intersect and we'll intersect with a linear gradient and we will bring that linear gradient from probably about here and we will end it there all right so we can we can see the color range adjustment that we're going to put in in a minute 100 percent here zero percent there and it will fade from 100 percent to zero percent as we go through the image and the only thing i'm going to do there is to lift the visibility of those greens and i'm going to add a little bit of dehaze and we'll lift the saturation again rather like that so you can see how we're building up some very strong very attractive saturated colors here and i think we've done quite a good job so temporarily i'm going to click done on there just to stop me from making any other random adjustments that i don't want to do and um, to the uh, things we've already got in place and then i am going to really make things pop in the foreground by bringing in a new mask um, a new straightforward linear gradient this time and we'll bring that up from pretty close to the bottom and we'll sort of terminate it there and the whole idea of that is to just lift up the foreground brightness and maybe just carry that up there and maybe just add a little bit of dehaze to the bottom and that'll just focus and punch out a little bit more contrast and it just helps us visualize all the colors and structures underneath the water so i'm going to click done for that because that's it that's done and i think the only other thing i'm going to do is put a little vignette on the image so again what we'll do is we'll open up the masking panel go to create new and this time we'll go for a radial gradient and i'm going to have to bring the image out to a very small view to do this yeah sort of 12 percent like that because this radial gradient is going to go way off the sides of the image so we're going to center it around about there okay 
and we'll just leave it there temporarily. Now, the, the green um, overlay is in the wrong place, okay? So we obviously need to invert it. So this is going to show where the darkening is going to take effect. And I'm going to increase the amount of feather, I think. Uh, but then I'm going to have to make the radial filter itself an awful lot bigger. And we're just going to move it just a little bit. And there we go. So our maximum darkness is going to be here, uh, followed by there. And it's going to sort of leak away into uh, no adjustment. I'm, I'm actually going to decrease that feather a little bit because I've got too much on the image. So there's just going to be a little tiny bit in that corner, a little bit more there, quite a lot more there, and uh, maximum darkness down here. But what we're doing is we're sort of trying to centre uh, the vignette on an, uh, on an area of the image, which is where we want the viewer's attention to be drawn to. And of course, to make that do its job, all we're going to do is turn down the exposure. All right, rather like that. Okay, and uh, we'll click done on there. And uh, yeah, it's um, not um, the same as I, the version I showed you earlier, but you know, go to a fit to screen view. It's done the job to illustrate um, how I use the masks inside of Lightroom and how critical um, for precise colour control an intersected selection can be and hopefully because I've shown you how to use them in Photoshop as well it'll increase your prowess in uh, masking inside of Photoshop and also help you with your Photoshop confidence yes alrighty helping people is what I'm here to do Okay, guys and gals, hope you found that useful, hope you found it interesting. Don't know how long it's turned out. Uh, the computer actually screwed up yesterday because I recorded this video yesterday. And I've gone to edit it this morning and it has completely disappeared. Yes, it has. So, uh, hence I've had to do it again. Um, but bad news is yesterday's was 45 minutes long. So I don't know how long this one's uh, turned out to be. But uh, I hope it's been... Um, ram-packed full of useful information and useful ideas for you so until the next time guys and gals stay safe stay well keep taking the pictures and uh, i'll speak to you again soon two root